Welcome everybody to the second talk of this uh, webinar, uh, which is a mini moon uh, webinar number number six. And uh, um, the speaker uh, for the second talk is uh, Dr. Gordon Chin. Gordon Chin, um, if I remember correctly, um, you you are graduated from uh, from Columbia. I did. Uh, yeah, because I read your early paper, you know, doing this uh, CO survey, right, carbon monoxide survey using the the the, the telescope on top of the uh, of the building. Uh, yes, yeah, this a four foot a four foot dish on top of the of the physics building at Columbia University. And, uh, right. There's a great, great, great thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he got his PhD also at Columbia, and then the he he, he then. Uh, spent a long, long time at NASA Gorda, you know, so he... My, it's my one and only job, I got a postdoc, <laughs> and then uh, they offered me a silver service position, which is, which is like being a, a tenured job, and uh, so uh, I never left. <laughs> yeah, and too good to be true, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, since then, he had been doing a lot of important mission you know, design and, and scientists for, for, for NASA. And previously, he was the project scientist for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO. Um, now he's, uh, and then he, he's jumping around you know, on a number of very interesting, exciting topics. Uh, now he told me that uh, he wanted to talk about the this, uh, Kogi, uh, Kogi mission, uh, which was also very interesting. But then I, I hope that he will focus on this mission uh, alone because he is going to drift off to some other things. So I hope that he won't do that for this time. No, no, no. Uh, this is this is only on, on this mission, yeah. Only on this experiment. Other things, you know, I will come, you'll come back to talk about them, right? <laughs> so this one, you only talk about the moon, yeah, the lunar mission, Kogi. Okay, Gordon, it's all yours. Thank you. So Kogi is an acronym, of course. Uh, NASA likes to have acronyms. Uh, Kogi, as you may know, is uh, is the Queen's. Uh, dog you can see the logo has has three corgis around around it and that corresponds to uh our experiment so corgi stands for confirming orbital remote sensing with ground information experiments and this is a suite of instruments for nasa's uh, prison program i'll tell you more about that later so i'm speaking for the corgi team there's people uh, that's working on this uh, instrument suite uh, the, the principal investigator is actually Dina Bauer uh, at the University of Maryland. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm her deputy and the institutional PI, uh, since this proposal is mostly going to be developed at Goddard Space Flight Center. And you see the names of all the uh, uh, co-investigators in the uh, in our Corgi team. Can you have the next slide, please? So Corgi is responding to the NASA PRISM program, and I'll tell you a little bit about what the PRISM program is about. So next slide. Uh, so NASA released a PRISM call for potential lunar surface investigations. And this is built around uh, what's called the commercial lunar payload services. This is allowing companies uh, to build uh, lunar landers and services to uh, which in which they could then provide uh, rides to the moon, either in orbit or to the ground. And uh, in response to that CLIPS program initiative, uh, NASA has uh, asked for a series of uh, of payloads or research investigations on the sur surface of the moon. And that's what PRISM stands for, another acronym. And so this is to generate a, a series of investigations that will ultimately uh, make up the manifest of instruments and investigations that will go to the moon and to, to determine where the future CLIPS uh, landing sites might be. For example, the uh, illustration you see was a recently chosen uh, uh, sm uh, lander uh, called the Masson XL1 that will deliver a science package to the moon's south pole in 2022. Uh, so that is that is what uh, CLIPS and PRISM is about. 
CLIPS is the commercial lunar payload services in which NASA buys uh, a ride to the moon. And PRISM is a uh, research and a payload uh, program to try to select investigations uh, to go on these lunar uh, 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 surfaces, the CLIPS landers to the moon. And this is in service to uh, the Artemis, the, uh, to try to pave the way back uh, for a man, uh, for human uh, uh, return to the moon from the United States, this Artemis program. Uh, it's a follow-up, of course, to the Apollo program that was, uh, what, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, Artemis is uh, the sister of Apollo, and in this new uh, era, of uh, gender equality, Artemis is, uh, the Artemis program will provide, make sure that a woman will be one of, uh, 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 step on the moon, surface of the moon, uh, along with uh, her companions. Uh, next slide, please. So in uh, 2020, uh, NASA released a, uh, a core, uh, a ROSES 2020 uh, for, uh, for solicitations for science programs to be delivered to the surface of the moon. And there are two uh, opportunities. One is to go to Rhino Gamma, a lunar swirl, in quarter four of 2023. And the second is to the Strutinger Basin melt, impact melt, which is on the far side of the moon in the second quarter of 2024. Uh, next slide. So, Corgi is responding to the second opportunity, uh, to the Schrodinger Basin and uh, the far side of the moon, in particular because it's uh, suited to the investigations uh, that we want to do uh, in, in, in terms of the Corgi science. And also uh, it's in line with the development time that we have for, I think what you're gonna see, it will be a, a very powerful suite of investigations uh, next slide, please. And this is a, uh, a view graph to show you uh, why, where uh, it's actually going. So uh, the Stroinger Basin is actually in the region uh, of the South Pole Atkin Basin, which uh, you may know is the largest impact uh, structure and one of the oldest impact structures in the solar system. Uh, you can see that the Stroidinger Basin, uh, you, which is uh, uh, highlighted in the left, is at, at a pretty uh, low latitude. It's about 75 degrees south uh, on the far side, and it uh, has many geological features, uh, in, uh, volcanic vents, uh, scops and gravins, uh, and, uh, and very smooth floor. Uh, which would make, uh, a, I think, a, a very good landing site uh, for this commercial lander. Uh, by the way, we don't know very much about what that lander is. We don't, there is a series of six or seven possible landers uh, that we have very little information on which lander it is, what the configuration is, and uh, we, we try to build this uh, uh, instrument set to be as flexible as possible so it could accommodate and be accommodated by uh, any lander uh, that uh, is there. They are given, we are given uh, certain masks and power uh, constraints uh, and uh, telecommunications constraints uh, and we know uh, this is the landing site uh, and very little else about the lander. Okay. Uh, I have the next uh, view graph, please. So what are we aiming for uh, with Corgi? Corgi aims to measure the lunar hydration cycle. Uh, next slide. Uh, as way back as, as 2009, uh, the Cassini flyby that imaged the moon uh, has actually seen uh, and detected uh, widespread water uh, on the surface of the moon, even in low latitude. Uh, this, is, this was done with the VIMS instrument on uh, Cassini. Uh, this is the flyby as Cassini made 
uh, as it flew by the moon. Uh, it sees two types of, of water, uh, of, of types of water. One is, is H2O itself in the surface, and the other is OH, hydroxyl. Uh, you can see that uh, there is, a, a, even, even in low latitudes, uh, this signature is, 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 is uh, evident, although there is hints of uh, water uh, being more uh, abundant as you go towards the uh, lunar polar regions. Uh, uh, observations uh, earlier with neutron spectroscopy uh, uh, on uh, earlier missions have shown that this, this is also true. And uh, water was definitely detected when LRO was launched uh, and the L cross impactor, which was a co manifested with LRO, uh, impacted uh, in the south polar regions and, and, and in the impact plume uh, detected uh, water. So, water, so unlike I think the general uh, understanding about the lunar environment, uh, water seems to be a, um, a abundant uh, a feature uh, of. of of, of the moon, and so it's not a desiccated, uh, uh, des desiccated uh, object in the sky. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what has also uh, seemed to have uh, come from a later observations is that uh, this, this water may be concentrated uh, uh, in certain regions, such as uh, the observation by Jessica Sunshine in 2009 in another flyby mission the, uh, with deep impact uh, that uh, this hydration feature at about three microns, uh, that the water seems to be concentrated at the uh, terminator, uh, the Dawn terminator as it is, as you can see the picture uh, in the upper right hand side. Uh, that Sunshine and Al in 2009 in science. Uh, and uh, with the Shanjiyuan M3 observations uh, in the lower right in the science advances, uh, Xiao Li and Ralph Milliken has shown uh, that there may be some diurnal, uh, diurnal effects uh, as well as a lot of this, this, this uh, local hour angle. Uh, 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 observation changes. Uh, so uh, the dawn terminator is to the left, the evening terminator is to the right. Uh, you can see that the zero latitude during the, it's, which is uh, 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 the, the various colors has, has various, uh, uh, you know, local morning has the most, and then it becomes more desiccated as, as, the, as it goes uh, into the uh, day. So, so there's evidence for diurnal variability, um, and there is, there is estimates if that this was a horizontal transport to balance this variability, that there's quite a large column of gas that's necessary. And if it's so, then this is, uh, uh, indicates a rarefied uh, exosphere uh, of two, 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 two this to able to support this type of variability that we talk about. Have the next slide, please. Um, more evidence of this uh, diurnal variability was, uh, was shown by two uh, instruments on, the, on LRO. That is LAMP, the ultraviolet uh, spectrometer, and LEN, which is the neutron spectrometer, which actually looks at two different uh, uh, regions of the regolith. Uh, lamp uh, could only be sensitive to the surface few microns depth. Uh, LEN, however, is sensitive uh, to cosmic ray generated neutrons, epithermal neutrons, which are, which are probing the, uh, about uh, one meter uh, below the surface uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the regolith. Uh, if you look at this again, what you see is this uh, desiccation uh, of this of of of, of water uh, during the noon time and uh, more abundance and uh, resettling of it 
uh, as you go to the uh, uh, dawn and uh, terminator. You see a little bit of phase lag uh, in the LEN data, which is the bottom right, uh, live in Guten Al. Uh, the top is from Hendrix and Al, uh, GRL, uh, that's the LAMP uh, data. Uh, the bottom uh, right-hand slide is from uh, Tim Livingood uh, uh, and Al, uh, 2017 uh, in Icarus. And you can see the little bit of lag. Uh, 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 what is uh, indicated is the, is the collimated uh, epithermal neutron flux. You can see that there's a decrease, but that uh, means there is actually more hydrogen, more water. That's a little bit inverse. Uh, of what that plot shows that so the lower uh, epithermal uh, neutrons you detect uh, in the in the in the dawn terminator uh, indicates more water and uh, the um, more uh, epithermal neutrons as you as you see above as it see increases after the local time noon means that there, it becomes drier and then uh, for some a process we think a hydraulic a, a water cycle process of some sort, uh, the water gets deposited again back in this one meter depth uh, uh, of the regolith as we go during the night. So there appears to be some kind of, 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 of variation uh, occurring uh, by these two uh, uh, examples, the remote sensing examples. These are all measurements taken from a uh, lunar orbit. Uh, that 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 shows this type of uh, diurnal uh, variability, and if you were to try to estimate how much of a transport is necessary uh, uh, to do this, you see in the third bullet that a really a lot of gas uh, is necessary to be able to support this type of transport, uh, much greater than a surface bounded exosphere. So. Uh, by this variety of remote sensing observations, we have different limits uh, to, to seeing what uh, uh, is occurring in the uh, lunar hydrogen cycle, uh, as it were, the water cycle. Uh, one must say also that there is an in situ measurement, uh, the LADI experiment, which had a neutral mass spectrometer, but that only observes uh, at a certain altitude uh, range, uh, which may be like 15 kilometers uh, from the surface, and had a mixed idea because I think the calibration of the LADI uh, mass spectrometer uh, is, 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 uh, is, is a little bit uh, 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 difficult, uh, complicated. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm not going to say too much about that. But there are other orbital uh, observations which give a very wide range of, of uh, limits to uh, what the exosphere content might be. Uh, but what is certain is that uh, this, the, uh, the OHN water <coughs> uh, observations, uh, which are the first couple of microns on the surface uh, of, of the lunar regolith, contains water uh, and uh, and one of our co-investigators, uh, Casey Hanabel, uh, made some uh, uh, news, I think, uh, a few months ago uh, with her observations from uh, the uh, Airborne Observatory Sophia uh, at the uh, six micron band of water, which has, uh, which has uh, uh, def definitively identified the water rather than OH or hy uh, hy uh, you know, uh, hydroxyl. Uh, um, bound in minerals uh, as being present in, in low latitudes and in the daytime. So uh, I, think, I think it's pretty secure that water is on the surface of the moon, uh, whether water is in the exosphere. It, a, to be able to support this type of diurnal uh, variation is not very certain at all. Uh, next slide, please. So what is our proposal for PRISM? I think we found a very uh, unique way of trying to address this uh, problem, uh, both the surface uh, variability of, 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 of water and also in the exosphere. So next slide. So uh, Corgi is a instrument suite which, which, which is a comprehensive package 
uh, to really try to understand uh, uh, what the water cycle on the moon might be, whether it's from um, micrometeorites or comets or solar wind, whether there is uh, horizontal transport or sublimation or, or, or releasing of water in the daytime from temporary cold traps, uh, as we try to capture in that, uh, in that uh, picture on the right. Uh, and we have essentially put together, consists of two instrument packages. One is called SSOV, the Submillimeter Solar Observation Lunar Volatiles Experiment. Uh, the PI on that is Tim Livengood. Uh, all these people are from Goddard, as you see in the bottom, in the Kauai uh, plaque, uh, you know, uh, uh, list and the affiliations. Uh, and there is a Corgi infrared uh, package called Corgi IR, which consists of AMP, uh, a AOTF moon probe. Uh, AOTF is another acronym which stands for acoustic optic uh, 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 spectrometer filter, to acoustic optic tunable filter in the infrared. Uh, uh, the PI for that particular instrument is Dina, who's also the PI for the entire suite. Uh, and Clumi, uh, the Compact Lunar Hydration and Mineralogy Explorer, the PI is Tilak uh, Hewagama. And the Corgi science objective is, is to try to measure the temporal variations in the water content in the moon's exosphere and the Earth's and the surface, uh, while the Corgi IR will also be able to identify, identify materials of interest such as, uh, you know, iron, uh, or to, that can be used for in situ resource utilization. Next slide, please. And this is uh, what we plan to do with Corgi. Corgi, you can see as the blue and purple instrumentation mounted on a notional uh, lunar lander. Again, we don't have much information about that, uh, what that lander is. Uh, this, I think, is taken uh, notionally from one of the vendors, it's called a peregrine uh, lander. Uh, so uh, we want to observe for uh, 10 Earth days, uh, which is uh, corresponds, uh, uh, Earth day corresponds almost essentially to one uh, uh, local lunar hour. So we'll be able to, uh, uh, to uh, observe uh, from uh, hopefully uh, near dawn to, mid, to midday on the moon and, and a little bit past that as it goes towards the Terminator. Uh, my understanding is that uh, none of the lunar landers, the commercial lunar landers, uh, will survive the lunar night. Uh, uh, so uh, we only have during this uh, 14, 14 Earth day uh, period of time during uh, the lunar day to be able to do this experiment. Uh, and uh, the unique feature of, uh, of this that we'll, we'll be able to observe the lunar cycle using the sun as a, uh, a, uh, a black body object for S-solve, and I'll show you that a little bit longer, uh, and it will collect spectra of water in absorption of the, uh, the 557 gigahertz ground state line, and OH, it's a photolytic product at 2.5 terahertz. Uh, that will give you a column of water from the surface to, the, to, to space, uh, uh, to the sun, essentially. Uh, the sun, uh, at the latitude uh, of, uh, of uh, Schrodinger Basin, will only be about 14 degrees altitude above uh, during the time period that we're talking about. Uh, Kogi IR in purple would produce hyperspectral panoramas uh, from one to two and a half microns, and it will span about 90 degrees in azimuth as it has its uh, little pivot, and about six degrees vertical stretching from the nerve field to the horizon, uh, indicated by that light purple sloth that we could see. Uh, next slide, please. Here is is a little bit close up of the package that we talk about. Here's the uh, Kogi design feature. Uh, to the left, uh, number two is S-Solve. Uh, it is a heliostat 
that retracts the moon and points at lunar surfaces and to an internal black body calibrator. Uh, it's all done by a set of mechanisms that is in there. Uh, we will use the same azimuth drive uh, for both uh, ESOV and uh, Kogi IR. Now, Kogi IR, it comprises of AMP, as I showed previously, and Plumi. Uh, it's, it's in this package. Uh, uh, what uh, happens is that number one is a, a dust cover which protects the optics during landing uh, and also acts as a black body uh, references between uh, scans. And it's all, there's, a, there's an elevation mechanism uh, that swivels and a uh, azimuth uh, axis which gives about 90 degrees unobstructed view. So this two is mounted on uh, two uh, mounting plates, adiabatic mounting plates, so that uh, the instrument itself is isolated from the lander body uh, in order to uh, provide uh, uh, an isolation in, uh, of the thermal environment for the uh, instrumentation itself. Uh, next slide. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what SSOB is trying to do. Uh, next, next slide. So here is uh, SSOB. Again, this stands for uh, the Submillimeter Solar Observation Lunar Volatiles Experiment. Uh, essentially, there is, it will measure the abundance of water and OH uh, from the lunar surface to space. And uh, because we are on the surface for this 10, uh, at, least, at least a 10-day period of time, uh, the variations uh, through that lunar day. So we will have a heliostat which tracks the sun as a high temperature background source. Uh, we have a fairly small telescope of 20 centimeters or so. And so uh, the sun itself will be beam diluted. Uh, so instead of a 60,000 6, 6, degree uh, back, black body temperature that we will see as a background, we'll see about a thousand degrees. But that, that uh, large background temperature actually will give us a very, very sensitive measurement. So I'll show you uh, a slide uh, to show you what the sensitivities we could reach in, in a short integration time. Uh, we plan to do high cadence observations throughout the lunar day. And we have extremely, because of this technique, this, uh, this uh, solo, occultation, solo observation technique, uh, uh, the sensitivity we could reach with the room temperature shocky diodes uh, uh, extraordinarily uh, uh, precise. Uh, the other feature of SSOV is that we have internal black body for calibration, and then we also could uh, go off the sun uh, for deep space calibrations. Uh, uh, that's how cold load and, and, uh, and hot load will be the internal uh, uh, instrumented calibration dark body source. Uh, but we could also uh, point the Al Alsmith of the telescope itself uh, to a nearby surface. And this is important because the lander will uh, be pretty uh, dirty. That is, there'll be, uh, we will not, you know, there's, there's probably a, 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 a gas fumes and water uh, which will, will actually come off of the lander itself because I don't think the lander will be subjected to any uh, any heating uh, in order to drive water off of it. And so that allows us to actually measure whether there is a local environment of water coming from uh, the lander itself and how that would dissipate and uh, be able to see uh, what that contribution is if we were to measure any uh, water. Uh, the OH uh, uh, variation is also important because H2O would phot uh, photolyze uh, in the uh, lack of uh, extreme atmosphere that's uh, at the moon. And it, it, the main plug will be OH. So we will have a column of H2O and OH that will give us a total uh, uh, inventory of what may be in the uh, lunar exosphere. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, essentially, this is the block diagram of uh, what we have to do. We have two Schottky diodes. Uh, one uh, would be at 2.5 terahertz for the uh, OH line. In fact, there's a manifold OH lines that we'll be looking at. Uh, and we have actually uh, been optimistic. Uh, we will use the uh, 
the, the, the lower frequency of sideband, uh, the, the lower frequency uh, mixer would be a uh, shocking diode, which is upper and lower sideband, and uh, we'd be able to actually get uh, the water at 557 gigahertz in one of the filters. And <clears throat> if we are extraordinarily lucky and the column is tremendously high, uh, we are also tune in to HDO, uh, the deuterium, the isotopic log of water, and be able to see uh, that if it is uh, present. Uh, that is just a stretch. Uh, what you see in the upper dotted line is the heliostat itself that would track the sun and then uh, also allow us to uh, look at the internal uh, black body uh, calibration source. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the sensitivities that we could reach uh, in terms of uh, 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 the, uh, in about 10 minutes of calibration. So, uh, and this also then constrains the, uh, uh, the type of sources uh, that we could rule out if we are able to see uh, 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 the source. So, uh, the LADI uh, spectrometer limit is something that we would not be able to, uh, to uh, look at. This is that. That's the retorted limit of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, 10 to the 10 molecules per square centimeter is the column. Uh, but we'll be able to see as low as 10 to the 12 molecules per uh, square centimeter. And that would be something which is a micrometeorite dominated uh, uh, limit. So we could probably see that. Uh, we could probably see uh, it if the water was uh, uh, comes from solar wind dominate. That's the, that's the hydrogen atoms from the sun. Uh, and then you could see that uh, if it's a mineral hydrate concentrations uh, from all the total reservoir of 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 uh, hydration that we've observed already from rem from remote sensing, we could see a signal in ten minutes uh, that would be just booming. And if, if we were to take the limit that is implied by uh, the lens observations of the, of the um, water in, that seems to change uh, within the one meter depth of the regolith, uh, that would be a booming signal uh, that we will see. Uh, and so you can see that this, uh, this, this SR in 10 minutes will allow us to, to uh, to immediately uh, see uh, if there's any of these uh, conditions exist. And because we have uh, essentially hours uh, available, uh, available to us and 10 days available to us, at least in the mission, uh, we, could, uh, we could probably get very, very sensitive limits and be able to see if there's any uh, diurnal variations during the time that we're on, on the ground with s uh, Next uh, slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit now of the Corgi infrared, uh, Clumi and AMP. Next. So uh, Corgi IR are actually two independent methods to verify uh, robot sensing me me measurements in the infrared, such as the M-cube uh, instrument on uh, Chandrayaan. Uh, the extended range, two to 14 microns, captures silicates, carbonates, sulfates. Uh, and you can see that in the right-hand side. Uh, OH, and, and uh, uh, it could be identified in three micron, but the overtones of, uh, of OH and H2 crystal lattices uh, could be seen at around 1.4 microns and 1.9 microns. And so uh, with uh, with AMP, including the infrared IR, one can distinguish between uh, in minerals and uh, uh, water itself. And if there are ices, you can see uh, 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 signatures of ice. And so this is a very powerful technique that allows us to uh, characterize not only uh, surface water, but ice uh, and uh, and uh, whether it's amorphous or crystalline ice, which gives us different temperatures, and also uh, a lot of the uh, minerals, uh, which is of interest uh, to, uh, to uh, general uh, uh, 
uh, uh, geology of, of, the, of the surface. And especially, I think, with, the, with, a, with the terrain as varied as we see at the Schrodinger Basin. Next slide. Uh, AMP is a small instrument. Uh, swap means uh, size, weight, and power. Uh, that, that allows us to map both dry and hydrated minerals of interest. Uh, it supplies ground truth for undisturbed ice and lunar regolith, and you could uh, determine composition and find structure properties that has been inferred remotely, but never validated uh, before. I think the important thing about a lander is that uh, for remote sensing instrumentations, it's a broad spectral, spatial average, whereas now with a lander, we have uh, spatial precisions uh, be able to see uh, millimeter scales of, of mineral species. Uh, the instantaneous uh, field of view uh, is uh, of, uh, of uh, amp is about five millimeters per pixel with a field view of two meters from a 10 meter standoff. This is uh, leverage is very uh, a mature uh, acoustic optic uh, tunable filter uh, technology. And what you do is you have a camera that, that essentially uh, um, takes a, a array, a, 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 a small uh, spectral resolution of 10 nanometers, uh, and that could be tuned from one to two and a half microns uh, range. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's Clumi. Uh, it's an instrument that measures water, ice, hydrate, and hydroxyl minerals and pounds of interest to, uh, again, this provides a ground truth for this remote sensing uh, uh, instrumentations that we have, I think I've shown to you previously. What's very important is that Clumi discriminates water from OH and identifies and map minerals of uh, input in, uh, in situ resource utilization. It has high special resolution, about a millimeter again, uh, and a few of, of two meters from about 10 meter standoff. It's a push broom uh, operation where you have these uh, uh, linear variable filters uh, over a spatial uh, sense uh, array of barometers. And what you have to do is to push broom in order to scan the same uh, terrain at it passes over these uh, different filters, and then you reconstruct the hyperspectral cube uh, uh, in order to uh, retrieve the, high, the, the information both in, in uh, spatial and in spectral uh, uh, parameters. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, uh, COG is unique and highly sensitive instrumentations will make in situ time correlated measurements of surface mineralogy, hydration features, uh, and water content, along with temporal variations and abundance of exospheric water and OH. Uh, the first, the SESOF targets the strong rotation lines of co gaseous H2 and OH with sub Doppler spectral resolution, uh, resolving power of greater than 10 to the 6. The Corgi IR combination of AMP and Clumi uh, brackets the fundamental molecular vibration bands of, of HTO and ice and mineral signatures. Now, together, Corgi forms a complementary, resilient, and uh, mutually reinforcing set of near simultaneous experiments uh, from each of the uh, instruments, which are th themselves very powerful. But the combined results. Uh, will form a very robust characterization of the enigmatic lunar water cycle. So you can see on the right-hand side, part of our uh, science traceability matrix uh, on what our four goals are. Uh, the fourth one, which I didn't say too much about, is the characterization of the thermal environment. And Plumi does that because of, the, of its infrared and because it's such a, such a large uh, spectral grass, it can reconstruct uh, and, and and uh, deconvolve the mineral features uh, from the underlying black body uh, spectrum and uh, get a temperature. And so uh, that is uh, our, our proposal uh, for Corgi 
and uh, this is not a done deal. We will hear back in June whether uh, this set of uh, suites will be chosen uh, for that uh, second uh, 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 opportunity uh, to land at Schrodinger uh, Crater. So uh, I think I've finished my uh, observ uh, uh, presentation wing and I'm open for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Gordon, um, for this presentation. On, on uh, so I, did I stay on subject? <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You know, that's uh, wonderful. You know, this is a very, very, very unusual for you. <laughs> okay. Um, any any question from the audience um, on this? Uh, I mean, it's more more very specific, you know, to a certain uh, measurements. But let's hear what whether there are questions or not first. If you have questions. Uh, uh, I would say any kind of questions uh, and, and mail yourself and ask a question. Uh, hi, this is Sean Chi from uh, CU Boulder. Uh, uh, I, this is very exciting and I wish you the best luck for the PRISM program uh, you know, selection. You know, this is a very popular uh, 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 opportunity. So the competition, as in all these opportunities, are, uh, is fierce. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, good luck. <laughs> uh, so, I, I do have two questions. One is, uh, do the uh, IR measurement be able to also provide thermal inertia or, or similar thermal properties characterization of the surface? And the yes. second question is, uh, yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, you can see uh, on this slide, our fourth uh, uh, science objective is to characterize the thermal environment and regular th and the structural properties. And uh, what it does is use the thermal physical properties of the lunar surface to correlate uh, with abundance and, you know, in, in order to retrieve that. Uh, it's, it, it, because it goes from one to 12 microns, you, you have uh, to bracket, I think, the uh, thermal uh, infrared, and that allows you to be able to look at uh, different regions. I think what's important is that uh, there are probably shadow regions, which are many uh, permanent shadow regions that you can't see from orbit. And that may proliferate uh, on the surface of the moon, especially at this high latitude that we're talking about at the uh, Schrodinger Basin. And so that uh, is there. And there, even during the high noon, uh, there may be regions which are behind boulders and underneath boulders, which uh, which is shielded from sunlight and may never see the sun and you get very cold. And so with the uh, spatial resolution of uh, uh, Corgi infrared, you should be able to see that. At, yeah, least, exactly. in the near, uh, at least in the near field. Yes. And because we are taking observation during the course of the entire day, we should be able to see how that evolves, how those environments evolve. Yeah, thank you. I think that, that that's important that to be at the high latitude sites. Yes. Uh, and, and another question is probably not so related is, uh, I'm probably, uh, I, I think I'm not familiar with the topic, but what is the origin of the water available on the surface of the moon? Is it uh, from comets or, or what, what, what are their sources? Let me uh, go back a couple of slides, four slides or something like that. Uh, for the uh, SOV, there's a table. Yeah. This, this so, one, yeah. yeah, you just passed it. Yeah. And so you can see the description uh, of uh, what we're talking about. Uh, uh, on the left hand column, uh, uh, the, the constraints that we have gotten from whatever observations they might be. Uh, if it's micrometeorite dominated, including, let's say, comets, uh, we could probably get a certain limit uh, of column. Uh, if, it's, it's, if it's from a solar wind, that's, an, that's, that's, that's that other column. And if we were just to say, see that the uh, mineral hydration concentrations that we see on the surface from M cube, uh, from deep impact, uh, from lamp, uh, you get another constraint that's the next to the last bottom. Uh, if, if, uh, if you see those type of uh, turning uh, diurnal variations 
uh, you would get, you, you could deduce a certain column uh, of water o, 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 OH. Uh, if you were to say that uh, uh, the variation that we see with Len, uh, the neutron flux, uh, uh, that gives us the largest uh, number of, uh, of uh, abundance that we're talking about, as you see. So that is the, the range. If you go up, I think, a couple more slides, uh, there is there is a, a, a photograph, a, a, a illustration of the potential water cycle that's, that highlights, I think, all the potential sources yeah. that we're talking okay. about. Go back the slide. There's two slides back, right? Is that right? Yeah. Two so slides back. Can you go back two slides back? Or more? Yeah, more. I think the next one. Nope, the one before that. Yeah, this one. Uh, yeah, one more, I think. All right, okay, good. Yeah, yeah one more. Ah, uh, uh, where was it? Uh, I thought, was that one that you have this um, 10 yeah. hours uh, scanning of the sun? Or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, anyhow, there was a, there was a, there was a, a, a Oh, let me go up. Go, 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 go back down again to Corgi. One more. One more. One more. Yeah. Well, oh, one more. Well, no, no, go in the wrong direction. Go in the wrong direction. Go back. Go yeah. back. Yeah. Go, 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 go forward. Yeah. Go. What? One more. One more. Well, I think three or four of that. Yeah. One. One more. One, yeah. Okay. One more. I think this is it. Yeah. So you see figure two. Oh, go back one. Yeah. Right. Right here. You can see on the right hand side uh, uh, a depiction of a potential uh, water cycle. So that so there could be uh, exogenous uh, sources as 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 you yeah. rightly pointed out. Could be dust. Uh, from uh, uh, micrometeorites, which churn the surface, uh, micrometeorites itself, which carries o OH in water, uh, could be comets, and it could be solar wind. Uh, but then there could be some endogenous, uh, you know, uh, uh, water cycle where, the, where we, we're seeing this uh, temporary water cycle that go, go from the surface or under, under the surface, and there's some kind of horizontal transport you know, that goes from the uh, dawn terminator to the evening terminator and, and becomes desiccated during, during the sun, uh, during the uh, 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 midday on the moon. So there's something is going on and we just don't know. And that's what, that's what we're trying to, uh, to, to try to uh, understand with this experiment, put constraints on that. I see, thank you very much. It's complicated. We don't know. I mean, it's mysterious. Right. I, mean, I think it's uh, rather complicated it's because uh, this uh, has to do with the origin, the source, source mechanism, yeah. and also it involves the transportation. Yeah. Um, we, see, we see a diurnal effect, and that is just very mysterious, you know? Mm, mm, mm. Uh, that's from uh, uh, Amanda Hendricks' uh, paper, right? Uh, uh, yeah, there's two. Uh, let's go back up a couple of slides. I mean, there is, there is, I mean, there is about three different uh, observations. So the, Amanda, yeah, first one is Jessica Sunshine. Yeah, this one on the top, that's Jessica Sunshine's Deep Impact uh, paper from Science in 2009. Mm. Uh, you see. Uh, the higher concentration of of water, the red at the at the dawn terminator on the right hand side, upper left right hand side, mm -hmm. and you see that the uh, noon, which is on the right hand side, uh, is is a lot desiccated uh, than on the dawn terminator. Uh, the Chandrayaan and cube also uh, has uh, this diurnal effect in the different color that we see at different latitudes. You can see that uh, occurring. Uh, so there is, there is a, 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 some kind of diurnal effect uh, occurring even uh, from the M cubed data. Uh, 
uh, the uh, following slide. The next slide, please. Yeah, and so as 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 a uh, nope nope back up one. No, you, you, you jump all the way to the end, so. Up, up, up. Up, 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 up to, I think. Okay, right here. My idea. Yeah. You missed that one, you know, the one with... Um... Yeah. Is that all down uh, now? This is yeah. Go go back down uh, two slides. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. This next slide. Stay in the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, uh, on the right hand side, that's Amanda Hendrix's uh, observation using uh, using the uh, lamp, the ultraviolet spectrometer on LRO. You can again see that's the local time. There's desiccation uh, in the noon, and then uh, somehow there's some transport coming back, and it gets re rehydrated uh, uh, both, you know, uh, uh, in in the uh, evening and, and and during the night. So there's transportation going on uh, with this, uh, and it is uh, the different colors are uh, different latitudes. Uh, the bottom slide is the uh, is the live and good, and I was a co-author of that uh, paper. Uh, in which we saw, and that is an indication of uh, water in the uh, in uh, uh, one meter below the, the uh, surface of the moon. So there is apparently, and you can see that uh, at six uh, a.m. Uh, they have a uh, deficit in lunar epithermal uh, epithermal neutrons, which indicates a hydrogen. Uh, abundance, higher hydrogen abundance, and then afternoon uh, becomes des becomes desiccated, and, <coughs> and then at 18 hours, which is the uh, uh, which is the uh, evening terminator, uh, you get uh, uh, some kind of rehydration. Uh, so there is transport of water, uh, either in the surface or subsurface, and we just don't know where how that transport of water may occur. So there is uh, at least three uh, body of remote sensing observations which indicates that this is occurring. And so uh, Corgi uh, on the ground sh should give us uh, both confirm if this is happening and maybe give us some clues about uh, where, where it is occurring. Okay, great. Um... <laughs> I mean, I think the goal will keep on talking for another ten, ten hours. Yeah. Um, so thank you for having me. <laughs> and uh, that's great. I mean, that uh, you you have to come back sometime, you know, to talk about some other things. And, yeah, you could. Uh, uh, you, well, hopefully, I could travel and I could actually visit uh, uh, Taiwan sometimes. You yeah. know. Before you go, uh, remember that uh, 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 ask uh, either John Kerry or Noah Petro for me. I'll try, I'll contact them for you. Yeah. Do you know another thing is do you know Barbara Cohen? You must know her. Yes, I do know her too. Yeah. Yeah. And then I have want you, to ask her to give a talk. Also, yeah, we try to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I write to her. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um gone. No, you're quite welcome. Uh, good luck with all your endeavors. Oh, you 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 excuse, you could stay on, you know, there's another some other interesting talk today. And uh, the next one will be by by Dr. Paul when Susante he, he's online now. And then okay. he, and then the, he. Oh, it's about the rover transportation. Yeah, I'll I'll listen to that. Thank you. Right. Okay. See you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.